Good afternoon and welcome to In Focus. I'm your host, Juanita Tautungi. Today we're putting Bill S3 in focus. That's the legislation currently in front of the Senate that, if passed, will end sexual discrimination in the Indian Act. Since the Act came to be in 1869, Indigenous women would lose their status if they married a non-status man. Their children would also not get status. Now, if Bill S3 comes into effect, thousands of people could become eligible for status. And we want you to join in on our conversation today. Our phone lines are open. Call us toll-free at one 647 2786 And you can also tweet us at APTN in focus. Use the hashtag Bill S3 in focus. Before I introduce you to our guests, let's set the scene. Here's part of an interview Dennis Ward did with Senator Lillian Dick earlier this month when the Liberal government announced the proposed changes to Bill S3 that would restore full legal status to First Nation women. The uh, news that the government would restore full legal status to First Nations women and their descendants born prior to 1985 was announced in the Senate. What would this amendment mean to First Nations women and their families? Well, what it will mean mostly is uh, it, it's removing, as far as we know, all the known female sex discrimination in the Indian Act, and it's backdating it to include people that were cut off be be because of the date of 1951. Senator, this has it, been a bit of a contentious issue. Will you be encouraging your fellow senators to, to pass this now? Uh, uh, definitely. Uh, I think the uh, government, uh, when we initially in June, the government had really stripped out of the bill any possibility of, of there being um, that sort of amendment and what they brought back to us was quite narrow. Uh, since, since June, they now have come back to us, to us with a bill that includes uh, the pre-1951 group. It's, it's in the bill and it actually hasn't been proclaimed in law yet and that coming into force of the law, of the proclamation of the law, will be at a later date. However, the Senate itself uh, will be receiving regular reports on the consultation and you know how the uh, discussions are going with regard to, re with regard to funding and so on. So the Senate uh, will play a big role uh, in ensuring that that section actually does get proclaimed into law. And joining us now is Jeanette Corbier Lavelle. She launched the very first court case challenging sex discrimination in the Act 47 years ago. And in our Ottawa Bureau, Todd Lamarant. He's been reporting on stories about Bill S3. Thank you both for joining us this afternoon. Let's start with you, Todd. Can you explain what is Bill S3, first of all? Well, Juanita, as you've already said, it was an attempt to end sex discrimination, discrimination in the Indian Act through legislation. Now, it's the result of a case brought by a Quebec man. His name is Stéphane Deschanel. And his problem was he could not pass on his status to his daughters because he traced status through his grandmother, who had married a non-status man. Now, if he had traced his status through a grandfather who had married a non-status woman, he'd be a 6-1-A and he'd be able to pass on status to his daughters. So obviously, this is discriminatory. It contravenes Canadian Charter of Rights and it's unconstitutional. A Quebec Superior Court agreed and ordered Parliament to introduce legislation to correct this. Why did Bill S3 miss its summer deadline to be done and passed into law? Well, actually, uh, that was the second deadline. There was a deadline before this past summer uh, par Parliament got an extension to this past July. I don't remember the date exactly, but it was an earlier mid-July. So to meet that deadline, the Senate would introduce the bill. That's why it's called S3. S stands for Senate instead of, say, Bill C-31. But the legislation had a 1951 cutoff date. So that meant if you lost status after 1951 and regained it in the mid-1980s under Bill C-31, there'd be no problem and there'd be no 6-1-B classification. But if you lost it before 1951 and regained it, the sex discrimination I described earlier would still be there. In committee hearings, people like Sherry McIver said, hey, this discrimination still exists. You've got to do something about it. 
So Manitoba Senator Mary Lou McFadden agreed, and uh, she came up with this amendment to get rid of this 1951 cutoff and actually go back to Confederation. And so it was nicknamed the all, 61A All the Way Amendment. The federal government in the House said, well, hold on there, we need to consult on this amendment. We don't know how many band members this might add. Estimates from 20,000 to 2 million were being thrown around by the media a few months ago. So the House said, get rid of the amendment. The Senate said no, so we had a stand up up until summer recess. The July deadline passed, and the feds had to once again go back to court in August and get another deadline. And the new deadline was December 22nd. All right, and you will continue to follow what happens at Parliament Hill when it comes to Bill S3. So what can you tell us is happening next? Well, next, it's going to go back to the House. Just because it went through the Senate doesn't mean it's law yet. It has to go back to the House. And no doubt they'll have to pass it by the middle of December before they go away for Christmas break. But that 1951 cutoff is still there. Uh, the House would not accept that uh, Senate amendment. The House has promised to consult First Nations and report back to the Senate on its progress with a promise to wrap this all up in three years. Uh, the Senate, on the other hand, has promised to hold the government's feet to the fire on the issue. Now, we don't know what to, to expect. I mean, uh, consultation for the McIver case was supposed to happen and consultations went on for 20 years. So if three years hence the, this is still not settled, expect another court case from someone who lost their status prior to 1951. All right, Todd, lots to watch out for. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. You're welcome. Let's go to our in-studio guest now, Jeanette. And as we mentioned earlier, you launched the very first court case challenging sex discrimination in the Act. This was 47 years ago. What made you challenge the, the Indian Act in 1971 in the first place? Well, to me, it's obvious. Uh, because as women within the Indian Act, we weren't treated the same as uh, the men within the Indian Act. And uh, we've been talking about this now, as you pointed out, for 47 years. I just can't believe it's taken this long, but here we are, 2017. And uh, when I think back to those early years, I was, uh, working with the company of young Canadians. I was just uh, new to the city. I had left the reserve uh, seeking, you know, a future. And uh, in my contact with uh, the uh, company of young Canadians and other organizations in Toronto, I was also one of the first members of the uh, Friendship Center movement. And uh, worked there as a court worker and saw all this injustice and uh, the way our people were being treated. And also uh, learned about human rights, justice and equity for everyone within Canada. So to me, I believed in it. I believed that Canada would uh, be responsible, you know, through the justice system and convey all these rights to people never occurred to me just because I had Indian status and was an Indigenous woman, a member of the Wikwemekong unceded territory, that I would be treated differently. And uh, consequently, 1970, I was married, April 11th. A month later, I was, not a month, within the very first few weeks, I received a letter from Indian Northern Affairs stating, you are no longer a member of the Wikwemekong unceded uh, Indian Reserve, and here's a check for $35. This is my part of the band funds. How well, did you feel at that moment? Well, I, I, I just honestly couldn't believe it. Number one, this is my home. This is where I was uh, born and brought up in my community, have the language, and all my relatives are there, and uh, th this is just who I am. So. How can uh, like a government come and say on a piece of paper, you are no longer a member, you have no access. If you, uh, if you visit or if you go to an Indian reserve, you can be charged with trespassing. All those other, uh, you know, I guess aspects of not having the status. 
that I had prior to April 11th. And uh, fortunately, I had uh, a friend, Clayton Ruby, who was also in Toronto talking about the rights of young people and, uh, and just that awareness that uh, we should be able to get justice from all levels. And uh, we spoke to him on Thursday night and uh, showed him the paper. And he said, my God, he says, you have one day to appeal, do something. So that Friday, he didn't ask who was going to pay him or what anything. He just, we just did it. He did it, in fact. And uh, next day, he appealed it. And this is what launched this whole court case, the challenge to the Indian Act, resulting, well, it's a long story. I don't think uh, we want to go into that now. But the three levels of uh, court systems, first was a county court and uh, lost there. A and in fact, I was really surprised at uh, the uh, prejudice, I guess, discrimination that was shown by the judge at that level because uh, it was Judge Grossberg. And I think I've shared this with others over the years and people can't believe it in the justice system. The judge uh, looked at me and he said, well, why do you want to maintain your uh, connection to your community? We all know what Indian reserves are like, and, but it's my home. And then the next thing he said, well, he said several other things, but the next thing he said was, um, you should be glad a white man married you because we all know what Indian women are like. And he said this right in the courts, and I couldn't believe it, honestly. Mm -hmm. It was, was not a good experience. Mm -hmm. So we went to the next level, and that was at the Federal Court of Appeal, three judges. And they said, obviously, it's discriminatory because, as uh, we all know, men were not treated the same way. Indian men within the old Indian Act could marry whoever, including a non-Indian woman, a white woman, and uh, she would gain Indian status. So this was the whole basis of our dilemma, that how is it that a white woman can get Indian status? And myself, I already had Indian status, married a non-Indian, and I lose my status, my connection. So that was totally unacceptable. So we won. At the Supreme Court of Canada, we lost by one vote. It was That's devastating. It. Yeah. Oh. And today it's back in front of the court. What do you think of today's challenge compared to what you went through? Well, t to me, uh, as I look back 47 years later, I really uh, believed in uh, justice and equality and human rights for all people, all citizens. <laughs> well, especially in Canada. And, and I look at our government and I see our prime minister and he's promoting uh, equality for all people, especially for women at the international level. But here we are in Canada within the Indian Act and especially within this current bill that is being uh, put forward. And I have to, I guess, recognize the Senate, like Senator Lillian Dick and the others in the Senate for really trying to push 6-1-A all the way. And if they had been able to do that, I believe I would have been entitled to those full rights that I had prior to 1970. However, my understanding right now is that this current bill that is being promoted by our parliamentarians and the uh, representatives of all three levels of government if they accept Bill S3 the way it is now, it's not going to make any difference to me because I'll still be left out. I will not gain those full rights that, uh, that should be there. If we truly are a, a, a country, a nation that promotes human rights and equality and justice for all, mm. uh, you know, it, it shouldn't be. And the other thing I would like to share with you and you know, for all our viewers is that uh, there have been many women, indigenous women throughout the years, starting in 1970. We know of Mary Tuax early, who was a Mohawk woman. And she started this first challenge 
even before I did. And she always wanted to regain her status and be able to go back to her community and just be buried there. She did manage that, but she didn't get her full rights either. And then we know of several others, like Jenny Margetts, who started the, the movement out in the prairies, and many, many others, hundreds of other women, sisters and friends. And we were all together, and we were striving to get that recognition so we could be part of our communities again. And we truly believe that uh, if people heard what was happening within the Indian Act, you know, what was contained in that, that obvious discrimination that uh, because of our gender, we didn't have full rights, whereas the men did. If there had been uh, equality within that uh, legislation, we would not have experienced so many difficulties and uh, mistreatments at our community level. Mm -hmm. Many of our women do not get the same rights or access, even though technically may be entitled to it, like in housing or uh, many other services. And uh, they leave, go to the cities. And now we see that uh, because of this discriminatory section within the Indian Act that's still there, even after Bill C-31, and Bill C-3, Sharon MacGyver's case, we still have that uh, secondary status, I guess I would call it, where our women are not fully recognized within the meaning of the Indian Act as equal and on par with our brothers and uh, all the men within the Indian mm -hmm. Act. So consequently, uh, there's uh, turmoil, there's uh, violence, there's resentments, and look at what's happening with the missing, murdered indigenous women and girls. And many of them, if we talk to them, we see that uh, it's because they've had to leave their communities, because they're not getting the same access to services, or they're being put down, they're being treated differently. That shouldn't be. And, and I think traditionally it wasn't like that. But this is all being imposed on us from the outside from governments, from legislators, whoever they are, who are putting all these little bits and pieces within legislation. Mm -hmm. And if they truly wanted to do something about it, they should talk to us. We've been here like four to seven years talking about this. I would like to believe that uh, my sisters who are in the spirit world now could relax and say, it's been worthwhile, we did it. I don't think they can say that now. Mm -hmm. And I hope that before I leave this, this uh, good earth here right now, that uh, I hope I can see that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who knows? It's, uh, it's definitely a continuing uh, situation and definitely a continuing piece of discussion. We do have a caller on the line. We would like to get to... Uh, get to a break, but we will take the caller uh, first. She's from Saskatchewan. Her name is Davida. Hello, Davida. Hello? Do we have Davida on the line? Okay. Hello. How are you? Oh, hello, Davida? Yeah. Hi there. Thank you for holding. What's your story you'd like to share? Well, first off, I have to congratulate everybody who has helped make this change. A lot of people just kind of sit back and don't say anything, don't fight for it. So for the people who have fought for it, thank you. You have changed a lot of people's lives, including myself. So for my story, um, I'm a First Nation woman, and I come from Fishing Lake Reserve, and I tried to register my kids, and I was basically told, well, the father of your children is not treaty. I said, okay, okay, I said, okay, I'm confused because my brother is treaty, but he's got a child with a Caucasian woman, but that child was able to get status, but my children can't, I'm confused, right? Mm -hmm. He goes, well, I don't make the rules. Um, but now my kids can have an identification 
as to where they belong and where they come from. And that is huge, huge to be part of such a strong group. Have you yourself done anything to see if you can get your children registered? Was, is, is there anything you've done? Yes, and basically I got a hold of the chief on my reserve. I said, okay, there's got to be a way how my children can get education. I got five kids, three of them in high school. And I said, they want to go to university. Um, there's got to be a way. And I basically got a runaround. And I knew of this the new thing that was coming out, and I explained it to them. And a lot of it comes through is not knowing he had no idea what I was talking about he's like no 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 your kids can never be treated they they can't be registered but guess what they can now in what way um well now i can now that this has passed i can go back and talk to my chief and my elders and say okay well now that this has been passed how do I get my children registered to be status? All right, Davida, thank you so much for sharing your story with us this afternoon. It's important to hear from people like yourself and, and in your situation. So all the best in continuing thank you. forward. Thanks okay, again. Bye-bye. Thank you. And we'd like to thank Todd Lamarand for joining us from Ottawa. And time to take a break. And when we return, we'll go to social media to hear what some of you are saying about Bill S3. And then we'll talk to Chief Rick Obamswin of Odenac, where a couple of current court cases challenging the Indian Act originate from. Stay with us. Join our conversation now. Send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Like our APTN InFocus Facebook page, follow and tweet us at APTN InFocus, or call in toll free at 1 877 647 2786. back. Let's go to social media now to hear what some of you are saying about today's topic. We asked, are you an Indigenous woman who is not eligible for status under the Indian Act? And you replied. Junlin says, my grandmother lost her status and my grandfather gave up his title land status and rights during Prohibition era. This one comes in saying, back when Indigenous men married non-Native and that woman got her status, the system is backward. And Jacqueline writes in, it dilutes and defaces our culture's identity and our heavy family unit traditions and beliefs. It has no place in the Indian Act. Ernie writes in, ending sex-based discrimination in the 1876 Indian Act creates equality for Indigenous women. And Brad writes in, frees up more of the first people of this country. Continuing on, we have Chris writing in, not as much as getting rid of the act and replacing it with recognition of the inherent right to self-government. And those are a few of the responses we had this week. And if you would like to join our discussion, here's how. Join our conversation now. Send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Like our APTN InFocus Facebook page, follow and tweet us at APTN InFocus, or call in toll free at 1-877-647-2786. So Bill S-3 is supposed to eliminate sex-based discrimination when determining status in the Indian Act, and it was a court-ordered result of the Stéphane Deschanel case. He wanted to pass his status on to his three daughters, but as Todd Lamarand reports, a Senate amendment has been rejected by Indigenous Affairs. Senator Mary Lou McFedrin was behind the amendment to eliminate all sexist provisions in the Indian Act because Bill S-3 still discriminates based on how a person got status before 1985. The Senate has said enough is enough. 
we're going to treat everyone who was born before the new IT5 rules came into effect. We're going to treat them the same. We're going to give them the same status. Indigenous Affairs Minister Carolyn Bennett rejected the amendment and wants to pass the bill as is and deal with other discrimination in a second stage of consultations that could last up to two years. Based on past experiences, Chief Rick Abomsawin is suspicious of more consultations. Everything in stage two is going to be beautiful. I mean, that's, I mean, maybe we should wait because it's a whole new world that's going to happen in stage two. But sometimes I have my doubts because I've seen stage two last a long time and still after stage two, we were back in court again fighting the case all over again. At today's committee meeting, the concern was an Indigenous Affairs report that 80,000 to 2 million people would seek status if the Senate amendment was allowed, putting pressure on limited resources. David Schultz calls the number grossly irresponsible. If they could show this will put 2 million more people on the Indian Register, we'd have that study bound uh, with gold engraving on every MP's desk. They don't have, they can't prove 2 million. 2 million is to scare people. Indian Affairs is trying to present to most of the chiefs by saying, you know, that this 2 million new people that are going to be coming, I mean, this is just, this is just ridiculous, okay? This is just a ridiculous number that somebody pulled out of their hat. A bomb someone has a message to chiefs to not panic and support the Senate amendment. People have already been living their lives. They've got jobs. They've, uh, you know, they're living in the cities. They're, they're not going to come home back to small communities to say, oh, gee, what am I going to do here? I'm going to start a whole new life. People will not give up their life just to go back home, especially if they've never lived there. Meanwhile, the man at the center of this issue, Stéphane Deschanaux, is willing to be patient to get things right. If we have to come back again and do the same uh, presentation to make sure that things goes right and all that will come back. Hopefully it would have been, in the, in the best word, it would have been the last time. So our next guest comes to us from the Akamaki First Nation in Quebec, as you saw in the story, Chief Rick Obamaswin of Odenac. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. No problem. Thank you for having me. So the story was from a year ago, as you just saw. Where are things at today? I'm pretty much at the exact same spot I was a year ago. Um, I can't really say that they're offering us much more than what they've said a year ago. Uh, a year ago, they told us that they wanted to break this into a stage two thing. Um, originally, the, the judge said we have the opportunity to solve all sexual discrimination at this time. I don't, we're just not going to. I guess that's the whole point is the point is now we're going to, you know, someone asked me, did we win the case? I said, I think we only made one step forward because we're going to move into stage two. And as I've said before, um, my community has been working on this type of thing since, since the early days. In 85, Evelyn Obamson, a woman from my community, is one of the women who was originally fought this, this whole status system of the women uh, losing their status and, and gaining their rights back in 85. In 85, and I was just reading this morning, one of the things that was said to the women back in 85 no, this will not solve all of your problems, but take it because that's what you're going to get. So I think we have a long way to go. There's, there's so many issues on sexual discrimination against women in the Indian Act. It just amazes me. It amazes me on how with this government, and I've said it before, with this government who keeps saying they want a, an open relationship with First Nations people, number one still says it's okay to discriminate against women. I'm just baffled by it. Um, I, I don't believe we, we, we have not won. We, we, have, we have a long battle to go. Uh, stage two, I, I mean, th this government is very, very good at saying, here's what, here's what we're going to do now. We're going to work out all the details later. Well, that really scares me because when we look at the, the, uh, the MacGyver case, when we look at the, the case in 1985, do you realize how many years we are past and we still have not solved the initial problem that was sent to court of sexual discrimination against women? We are still fighting the same battle. I had told the Senate and told Indian Affairs we will not give up on this fight. If we, what you hand us, if it is not completely settled, we will be back in court. We'll continue to fight this. They told me stage two will take two years. Well, I'm not so sure because, like I said, this whole thing started in 1985, 
and we're we're a long long past two years, and things were supposed to be solved within the first few years. So, do I have faith in something being solved in two years? No. All right. I'd like to bring Jeanette into this conversation. What what what's your reaction? Well, I uh, totally agree with Chief Obamswin that uh, it's the irony after all this time, and we still haven't achieved the original goal, which was uh, equity within the Indian Act, or take out that discrimination. And uh, Chief Obamswin, uh, I guess just to say to you that uh, it was originally there in the Indian Act, and here we are, 47 years later, that discrimination is still there. Legislation at that time said, well, we're not really discriminating against our women, indigenous women, because they're equally discriminated against within the Indian Act because it's all the Indian women are treated the same. But that's not acceptable in this day and age, you know? And uh, the chief knows and uh, Mr. Desheno knows that it should be equal for both men and women to recognize their family and their descendants and that they have rights to their homelands, their culture, their tradition. This is who they are, this is who we are. And uh, it should be there. Uh, taking another year or two for consultation isn't going to make any difference because we know the basis, the basis of uh, this whole discrimination has to be removed and having to consult on it isn't going to change that fact. So right now the Senate and the government of Canada should say, okay, let's take out that discrimination and let's go with 6-1-A all the way. The Senate knows that. And I'm sure if we can mobilize enough people across Canada to write to their parliamentarians, their members, and, and say, in this day and age, we cannot afford to have uh, human rights violations, uh, you know, uh, lack of uh, equity and equality within any legislation. Look at what happened to those four members, that New Canadians. Government of Canada had to pay millions of dollars to them for the loss of their rights as citizens of Canada. What about all our Indigenous women and girls and families, many men too? What if they could uh, sue the government and say, look, we've lost our rights. You know, mm -hmm. what can we do about it? It's far reaching and I don't believe consultation isn't going to make any difference. Doesn't uh, Bill S3 advance to where you feel the Indian Act needs to go? Well, obviously, I think all uh, our people, you know, Indigenous peoples, uh, status people within the meaning of the Indian Act, this is ultimately what we should be striving for. And if we could do that, it uh, would be good because we would then be able to look at our traditions and put into place a uh, our own governance, uh, uh, well, our own governance acts so that we recognize our people. There are some reserves now who are down to their last member, you know, within 10 uh, status people within their uh, reserves. What's going to happen to those reserves? It's going to revert back to Crown Land once they're gone. But if we had our own uh, decision-making our own governance, this wouldn't be. And maybe this is all part of the political system where reserves who no longer have members will be taken over by uh, resource development corporations because they'll say no people living there, so let's take it over. I mean, there's so many other issues I think that are here. And I think there will be a time uh, in the very near future, and I would like to see this happen, my own community, we're working on our own uh, uh, governance uh, laws and our own uh, laws to help us live together and be recognizing who we are as members within our community. Mm -hmm. That's happening, and I'm sure it's happening other places. There are many other places that it's not happening. So that's why it's going to take a little bit longer until we reach that point when we can throw out the Indian Act. Yeah. Chief Obamaswin, do you think that there are other issues in the Indian Act that, that you think need to get changed? 
you know, there, there's an awful lot of issues, but if I could just add a little bit to that last conversation, okay? Um, one of the, I mean, you, 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 first off, you have to understand um, our communities creating our own government systems, our own citizenship codes, our own membership codes. That is one thing. Status in the Indian Act is something totally separate because there's also financial obligation. And I guess some of my biggest worries with saying that we will do away with the Indian Act, or as Indian Affairs has been preaching to me for the last year, we want to get out of the registration business. I think what they're really saying is they want to get out of the financial obligation business. So this is some of the concerns of saying, you know, if we, if we get rid of this Indian Act and we get rid of all these things so quickly, what are we completely getting away with? We, we need to make sure that there is something in place first. There are so many things wrong with the Indian Act. You almost have to go through it step by step to fix these things. So in saying that, well, instead of trying to fix things, we'll just get rid of it. My scary part is, is what's going to be next? Because you have to keep in mind that for First Nations communities to go into to enter a self-government system, a self-government underneath another government is not self-government. So we have to be very, very careful on what our next steps are going to be. And let's be honest. The, the, all these cases of saying that we want to solve the, the sexual discrimination in the Indian Act, when it comes to the government, this is not about whether or not they want to solve the problem. This is, this is completely financial to them. They're literally saying, I mean, and with their, with their ridiculous quote of millions of new people, they're sitting saying, how is Canada going to, going to afford this? So this is not about them saying, well, how can we solve the problem? They're sitting there saying, this is a financial, a financial problem. But not once have we ever got down to sit at the table and speak of that side of the fence. Instead, well, we'll look at it later. We'll look at this later. We'll, we, we know there's sexual discrimination. You know, I mean, I have women in my community and that have, in, in the past, their, their fathers or their brothers at a time period had the right to sell off their rights. And it was for $8. But in those days, women were going to lose their status anyways. So what difference did it make? We take the $8 because in those days, that was a lot of money. I still have women that have not gained their status back under those cases. I have a woman in, in my community who was literally told in court, and we have the documents, she was told that if she had one more child, she'd be put in prison until she was 21. So she ended up leaving the community and having the child in the States. To this day, the child has no birth certificate, no baptism certificate, so has never been registered anywhere. Hmm. The government literally said to me, she doesn't exist. And I'm saying she's beside me. What do you mean she doesn't exist? So these are cases that, I mean, there's case after case after case that needs to be reviewed and looked at. Two years of, of sitting here saying, well, we're going to discuss, we're going to discuss. We all know the cases. We all know the problems. Indian Affairs knows the discrimination within the Enact. They knew it in 85 when, the, when, they, when they reinstated the women. They knew all the issues that they didn't put in there. So after all these years, we are still at the table fighting the exact same things. Many of the women who have originally fought this case and many of the women that went through this case are no longer with us. And that's why it's important that we continue to fight this for they're not forgotten. And for the women who, who have left us, who never gained their status, will at least feel that they lived through here for something. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this, this, case is, it, this case is not over. Right? It's far from over. Yeah, sounds like it. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon, Chief Obama's win, and, and good luck to you as well in, in uh, moving forward with these uh, current uh, court cases. Um, I do want to get to another caller before we okay. take another yeah. break. This is, uh, this is a caller coming to us from Prince Rupert. Timothy is on the line. Hello, Timothy. Yes, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for holding. What do you have to, what do you have to share about Bill S3 or the Indian Act today? I just, uh, just a re reminder that uh, our ancestors had had their, their law laid out before INAC or government came into being and uh, that uh, the matrilineal is the backbone of the culture. They, they, they do have the authority over everything in, 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 in our culture. 
they they hold they hold the names, and the father is what what they call you. You come from the father's side, but we have we have a clan clan system in effect, and in in what 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 I'm hearing today is totally you know out left field because the the government tried to do away with Indians to save themselves money, but it didn't work. We know that in the past 100 years at the residential school. I'm a survivor, and I'm still here. And I know I learned, I learned my culture. I speak my language fluently. So that didn't work. So uh, I follow my mother's side, and I understand that, and uh, I come from I come from my father's, from my my biological father's clan. But uh, I, I'm definitely connected to my mother's side, and uh, this discrimination thing it, it's it's obvious. You don't have to be educated in any shape or form to understand where that's taken us. It's deeper, we're, we're being put deeper and deeper into oblivion when you don't want to understand where we, how our culture is laid out. All right, Timothy, thank you so much for your thoughts this afternoon. We really appreciate uh, the phone call. Yeah, I, I, I had to make this call because I, I just turned my TV on and I seen this program come on, so I, I waited to, to get my opinion in. Just, right. uh, that, that, that's how it is, and the government wasn't around when our ancestors were. All right. That's uh, a good way to leave uh, your thoughts out with us this afternoon. Thank you again for calling in, Timothy. We need to take a quick break, and when we return, a member of the Little Pine First Nation in Saskatchewan will join us to share the challenges that she went through to get her status. Welcome back. Well, our next guest joins us by phone from Big Island Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. Donna Partridge is a member of the Little Pine First Nation and has had many struggles to get her status. She grew up in Loon Lake. Hello, Donna. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Start Hello. From, start from the beginning for us. Where did your struggles start? Um, I guess the, the little struggle was back when I was a kid following my teenage years. Um, so what I found out was my mom was a recognized uh, member of the Makasag Egan Band, which is uh, in Loon Lake in Saskatchewan. And uh, um, I don't know what happened um, after she was born. Um, maybe it was not long after she, um, maybe a legislation fell into place or came into play, and then she became non-treaty. And so, and so that was back in 1955, according to some documents that I'm, I'm reading. And, you know, I did a little bit of research uh, on my part. And so, so growing up childhood and teenage years, I, you know, knew that I, I was not a, a, a treaty individual or a treaty First Nations, whatever you want to call it. And... Um, you know, it was it was not until she got married back in um, '79, I think, is when she got married, that uh, she became a treaty uh, individual, and and along with that, um, the man she married uh, adopted me and my brother, so we became treaty as well. But I do have a biological father who was a. Uh, you know, a First Nations man who was a, a treaty individual from the Big Island Lake First Nation, which I'm, curr you know, currently at right now. And um, I don't know why that, you know, why 
for for me personally why that route wasn't taken for me to to become treaty but uh when we're talking about my mom and her younger brother and then they have a younger sister as well with the same father same mother um two out of these three children became um not treaty uh, the, the third child was treaty with the same parents, so I, I don't understand what took place or what had happened for my mom and her brother not to be treaty when, when they were, you know, right after they were born. Mm -hmm. So what, what does being treaty mean to you today? Being treaty um, means that you're, I guess, classified under, you know, a system. You know, which is probably the, when I say a system, it's under the Indian Act. You belong to a, a community. And so I'm listed under the Little Pine First Nation, but I've actually never grew up there. I don't come from there. My roots are not there. My, my roots are from the Makwasagagan First Nation because that is where I grew up from. My mom was born there. Her mom was born there. Her mom was actually a, a treaty individual from there. And then her mom and her dad were, you know, treaty individuals from the Makwasagagan Bank. And so, you know, that's what, um, when we're talking about treaty, I, I think um, it's just a classification to just... Um, classify people like 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 us mm -hmm. well Donna it sounds like uh, you've got quite the story to share I wish we had more time to to get it uh, flushed out a little bit more um, and I do appreciate you reaching out and and sharing your story with us on in focus this afternoon and um, I wish you all the best in in whatever whatever comes uh, your way when it comes to being a status person. So thanks again for joining us this afternoon. All right then, no okay. problem. Thank you. Thanks. And as I mentioned, we are almost out of time for the show, but I do want to give Jeanette uh, some more time to, to speak with us about, uh, about what's on her mind about mm -hmm. Bill S3 and the Indian Act. We only have okay. a couple of minutes left, Jeanette, if you want to share with us some more. Okay, miigwech. Uh, just one point. Uh, I think there is uh, a misunderstanding about treaty and status because we have many of our members who are full status who are not treaty. So depending on the province you come from, that does make a big difference. So, and uh, losing treaty, I think, was uh, just an arbitrary decision within the Indian Act by, once again, the government officials who would take your treaty away if you married someone even from uh, another reserve. So that should be investigated. But getting back to currently right now, Bill S3, uh, to me, we should go back to the original uh, Senate proposal, which was uh, all our women who lost status uh, and the uh, you know, children, men as well, should be able to regain full 6-1-A status. And that's the only route to go. As I said, the government and the Senate has recognized that, but they're just postponing the inevitable. And I'd, once again, I believe it has to do with funding and money, but uh, what is important here? Is it the lives of our indigenous women and girls you know, who are still being treated differently as they are uh, you know, forced out of our communities? Or is it the money? You know, corporations, you know, th they can get access to money. I don't believe that's the real uh, term that we should be looking at. We should be looking at how precious and how valuable our women, girls, and all our people are to our communities and make sure that we recognize them. They are within our nations and we must ensure that especially mm -hmm. us who are there recognize them and welcome them. Mm -hmm. And I totally believe that. That's and I hope it happens within my lifetime. 
I sure hope so as well. Thank you so much, Jeanette. That's all the time we have for the show this afternoon. Thank you to all our guests for joining us today. Todd Lamarand, our reporter in Ottawa. Jeanette Corbier-Lavelle, thank you so much for coming in studio and being one of our guests. Yes. Chief Rick Obama's win and Donna Partridge. You can see the replay of the show tomorrow at 12 o'clock Eastern Time, 11 o'clock Central. And you can go to the website to check out our previous shows at abtnnews.ca slash backslash in focus. Weekly podcasts are also available at aptnnews.ca backslash in focus dash podcast. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Juanita Tautungi.